All right, thank you everyone for coming. Let's uh, introduce, oh, sorry, I'm introducing uh, Emily to talk about Rust. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, so I hope that you're here today to talk about Rust and IoT with me. Um, if not, there are several other parallel talks that I would absolutely be in if I weren't speaking in this particular slot. So I've personally contributed to the Rust project in various ways for several years now, and in past lives I've built all kinds of robotics and embedded projects. Now, you won't have heard of me from the prominent embedded Rust projects or the fantastic embedded Rust book, because the experts who work on those things know better than to try to fit a summary into a 45-minute slot. But that's what I'm going to try to do for you. When I first proposed this talk to LCA, there wasn't a central repository of all the scattered knowledge about doing Rust on embedded systems. And between that time and right now, some amazing resources have been produced that I will refer to and refer to you to throughout the talk. So that frees up a bit of time that might otherwise have been spent on facts and details for a bit of an impromptu birds of a feather session at the end. Um, so that you can take advantage of what really makes a conference like this special, which is the other humans and experts in the room. So what I'm going to do at the end, I'll ask everyone who wants to connect with others about Rust, whether that's recruiting for a project of your own, sharing a project that you think is cool, or asking for a project to contribute to, to give me a quick rundown on what that is, and I will thank you with a little plush Rust mascot for doing so. You can then display that through the rest of the conference and people will know to talk to you about Rust. So, first things first, most of you probably know a bit about the Rust language. It attacks the apparent dichotomies between human readable code versus fast performing code, ergonomic to develop code versus verifiable um, certified bug free code by sweeping a lot of problems under the rug of the compiler. They then build a compiler and associated tool chain that's capable of solving all of those problems. Um, to write code free of certain classes of bug in any language, you need to follow a bunch of rules. And what sets Rust apart is that these rules live explicitly in the language spec and in the compiler, and they're enforced at compile time rather than at the time when you're thinking and reasoning and designing the code or at runtime, like interpreted languages often are. So what we call safe Rust is the set of all programs that you know are within this weird, fractal, barely defined space of correct programs. And that means that there's going to be some correct programs that you can't necessarily prove are free from bugs, especially when it comes to um, I.O., any interaction with the outside world. And so for those cases, when you need to write programs that are outside of what you know is safe, but you as a programmer think they're inside of what's correct, you use what's called unsafe Rust, which does permit you to write some programs outside of that space of correct things also. And the language is under rapid and active development to expand what's safe, to push the boundaries of safe so they get as close as possible to the boundaries of what the correct programs free of memory misuse are. And so if you've come to my LCA talks in the past, I've talked about how the new bleeding edge features that we're not sure whether they're really going to land come out daily in what's called the nightly Rust channel. Some of them graduate to a beta channel, and then a stable channel with the tested features is released every six weeks that's always backwards compatible. One thing that's new since last year and since last we talked here about Rust is that they've also added the concept of editions. And editions are an opt-in feature basically that allows wonderful new syntax, wonderful ergonomics, increased safety that might not be backwards compatible to the beginning of time. So if you want some backwards compatible feature, you don't have to opt into the addition, but if you want the newer, cooler syntax like saying use the crate instead of extern crate whatever, then you can opt into an addition with those features. 
So to talk about Rust on IoT, we need to pick a definition for what this buzzword even means. So IoT is a bunch of physical devices with some kind of computer in them. And those devices interface with the physical world through their inputs and outputs, and they interface with each other and often a server over the network, often a public network. What could go wrong? Um, in practice, this often may, means a design pattern where you have a bunch of individual little pieces of low power, low capability hardware, heavy on the I.O., that talk back to some centralized server or database, which then does some heavier computation on what it's learned from them and possibly sends instructions back out to them as to what outputs they should give into the world. So, we need software on both sides for a real IoT system, both that server side and the embedded devices side. Of course, there's also the case of just a mesh of little devices talking to each other over a network and never actually talking back to a server, but that's less common than the server case when you need it to interact with humans or interact with an app that a human is going to be working with. So both sides of this equation, the embedded low-level stuff and the high-level server stuff, can be written in Rust. So most programmers find working directly on the hardware to be much less familiar and more challenging than writing code that runs basically as a server. That central server or database in most IoT design patterns is actually super familiar if you've done web development, application development, atop an operating system. And that makes them a great place to start if you're learning a new programming language for the first time. There's often more mentors and resources for running a program atop an operating system then, and it's easier to reproduce, for someone else to reproduce the error you're getting than if you're going directly on hardware. Um, plus, writing atop the operating system lets you avoid thinking about a lot of hardware problems that the operating system just solves for you before you even notice them. So, if you choose to start an IoT project where you have a bunch of little devices talking back to some server that does something clever over the internet, you can choose to use a specification such as the WebThing standard, which you can learn about at the iot.mozilla.org link. And you can build on the work that others have done to get the physical hardware talking, speaking that standard and talking to that API that you expose. So you can get a working IoT project doing minimal, if any, um, development on the hardware to start with. So the Mozilla Things project has a Rust example where you can write the server in Rust. Um, their example shows how to use the WebThing crate to talk to a dimmable light bulb and a humidity sensor that expose the WebThing API. And you can talk to anything that talks to that API which you can find in the wiki list of supported hardware um, there. So if you're interested in learning more about building IoT through this web thing spec, I'd recommend Kathy Jory's talk um, tomorrow in room A3 from 3.50 to 5.30. It's a workshop on starting out with it. She won't be using Rust, but she will be using the framework. So I point this out because when you run a program within an operating system, the standard library makes all of these useful guesses about what you want for topics like multi-threading and I.O. and various primitives. So it's better to avoid re-implementing these features if you can get away with it because that standard library has been well tested for years and years on a variety of platforms. As a rule of thumb, if a piece of hardware that you're considering is used to run a Linux derivative, you can probably write Rust with the standard library to target it. A great example of this, and probably in the room here right now, is Wesley Moore's ePaper badge for this conference, whose code is written in Rust with the source at that GitHub link right there. So he runs a Linux derivative on a Raspberry Pi, which means a regular old Rust program can interface with the peripherals like the ePaper screen through that operating system. Um, Wesley, could I ask you to raise your hand if you're here? So that, there he is if you want to talk to him uh, later on. So what about the embedded case. What about the tiny little chips, the ones with the power, size, or price constraints that rule out the possibility of running an operating system to run your program on? Writing software for these, like writing the operating systems themselves, is called embedded programming. 
When you don't have an operating system exposing those multi-threading, those I.O. primitives to your standard library, you obviously can't use a standard library and instead you have to be much more explicit about how you want your program to perform those tasks. So micromanaging how the hardware is used means that the output code is less portable across different platforms and more difficult to compile across platforms. Um, fortunately, Rust provides support out of the box for quite a few different architectures. So Rust categorizes its support for different families of chips um, in what it calls tiers. So the tier one is guaranteed to work. So every change to Rust runs tests, they build the code, they test the code on that architecture. And if it fails, then they go back and fix it before pushing that change. Tier two is guaranteed to build. They'll build the code for that architecture and if it builds good enough, they don't necessarily have the hardware available to test the code on that architecture. And tier three is basically, this might work, but we don't really make any promises um, because there's not the resources available to do that continuous building for it and continuous testing on it that tiers one and two may have. So those different levels of testing basically correlate to whether you're likely to be the first one to find some bug that a test might have caught. If you want a full list of all of the supported um, architectures and platforms, you can check out the Rust Forge. They have a wonderful list with the cargo support and all of the details on there. So what happens if you want to target a platform that isn't supported yet? You can add support, but the difficulty of doing that will vary based on whether the tools that Rust uses are already ported to that platform or not. So to understand the different processes, you can use to add Rust support to some other architecture that doesn't have it yet. Let's quickly recap what a Rust program goes through as it's being compiled. So when you compile Rust code, it goes through a series of steps. First, the compiler makes what's called MIR, which is an intermediate representation of that code within Rust. That MIR is what your IDE can use to expose any errors in your code as you're writing it. And relatedly, if you're not using it, um, Rust integration with your IDE yet, I would strongly recommend checking out areweideyet.com, which will tell you exactly what the status is and where to get that integration. So, after MIR, they make LLVM, which is the low-level virtual machines um, intermediate representation, so the LLVM IR. And that goes to a big old um, utility, the LLVM, that does optimization on it to optimize away any code that's irrelevant to the final um, outcome of your program's behavior. And the LLVM uh, converts the IR into a runnable program. So if you want to see what your code looks like at each of these steps, which is really interesting to see where did those abstractions go away, um, when did they go away, you can either use the emit flag to rest C to tell it emit ASM, emit LLVM IR, emit MIR, emit LLVM bytecode, whatever it is that you want to see, or um, if you're not depending on a lot of other crates and you're just curious, you can hop into the Rust playpin at play.rustlang.org and under the little run button up in the corner, you can ask it to show assembly or show IR for that particular program that you've pasted in. So to figure out whether your embedded device is supported or can be supported by Rust, you first check whether its architecture appears as a target in that platform support list that I linked earlier. If it's not there, have a search around the web to see whether LLVM can target it yet. If you find that you're working on a platform that has LLVM support but doesn't have Rust support yet, contact the Rust Embedded Working Group for guidance on how to add it to Rust. If you don't want to use LLVM, let's say you're not on an architecture that it does support, but you want to emit Rust code for it, you can also try a project called CraneLift. CraneLift used to be known as Craton, so you've probably heard of it, even if it sounds a bit new right now. So it's an alternative code generator, and it takes in a slightly lower level intermediate representation than LLVM uses. And you can use it from Rust-C just the way you'd use LLVM. And it's primarily 
um, targeting larger um, regular like x86 kind of things, but it's written in Rust, so if you want to write Rust to add support, it's a good place to look. And regardless of which code generator you prefer, if you want to add a new target to Rust, you do have to add it to some code generator, and that's a bunch of work. There's one other workaround that you can consider. So if you, don't have, if you do have a platform that you can write C for, but you can't generate Rust code for that platform through either of the code generators, you can try turning your Rust into C and then compiling that C through whatever methods you were using anyways. Um, Aitan Masenkis did this to get Rust running on the ESP8266 by compiling Rust into C with the MRust C compiler and then putting that C through the usual tool chain to target that board. You can see his project and scripts at that GitHub link that I've got on the screen. The drawback of using MRust C is that on its own, it doesn't do the same borrow checking and validation that regular Rust C does. So it just hopes that you passed it valid Rust to start with. Um, you can make sure that you've got valid Rust by running it through Rust C first, but if you don't, if you skip that step, you can introduce all kinds of errors. So finally, you might find yourself in a situation where you want to use some C code alongside some Rust code or a little bit of Rust code alongside some C code in an embedded context. And if that's the case, the embedded Rust book goes into great detail on how to interoperate between embedded Rust and embedded C. Um, if you want to take advantage of existing C code in this kind of way, um, check out the embedded Rust book uh, at that link. Additionally, if you're integrating between C and Rust, you'll probably find yourself spending a lot of time writing um, foreign function interface bindings between the two. Some of that binding writing um, challenge can be automated using the crate called bindgen that you can find on crates.io. So if you're working without the standard library, where do the primitive types and the methods come from? So even when you opt out of the standard library, most Rust programs will have the core crate available. It doesn't help you with I.O. and multi-threading in the same way that the standard library does, but it still exposes a bunch of the primitives and the macros that you're used to having. You can find all of the core crate docs and compare them to the standard library docs there on the Rust site. So if you're on a chip that's more powerful and you think it could run something kind of like the standard library, but that won't work for some reason, you may find yourself wanting to make a custom standard library. And this is a workflow that's also supported. The tool you want in that case is called Zargo. It's like cargo, but with an X instead of a C for cross-compiling. If you're watching this talk on the recording after 2019, um, Zargo's sysroot building features may very well have finished integrating into Cargo. So check its wiki, and if it says, yay, we landed in Cargo now, just use the Cargo features instead. So after all that, let's hope that you've found a device with a story for targeting it with Rust. Maybe that story is LLVM, maybe that story is use crane lift, maybe that story is work through a C tool chain. So next, check out the awesome embedded Rust repo linked there. Um, which is another new thing since I initially proposed this talk, um, to find what support crates and example code are available for your platform. So many popular embedded platforms have several support crates that are already written for them. Remember to check the Rust versions that they use and have a look at the activity, the recent activity for the repository of the project when evaluating whether it's still active or whether this was someone's weekend project several years ago and may require a bit more effort than you thought to get it up to date. So if you've only been doing regular Rust to top and operating systems so far, You'll be almost overwhelmed by all of the new words and concepts that pop up when you jump into embedded development. And many of these concepts are just common to all embedded development everywhere, but they kind of seem scary when they all come at you at once. So I'd like to go through a few of the first things that you'll need to be acquainted with when writing REST to target an embedded system. First, you'll see a bunch of references to HAL, the hardware abstraction layer, not the 2001 uh, musical machine. So this um, 
expresses the way that those standard functions that you'd normally get through the operating system should be performed on a particular CPU family. So HAL crates for a given board that you're working on are a great place to find example code as well, since the person who wrote the HAL crate usually did it as a side effect of trying to get some other more compelling project working on that hardware. For instance, the Tomu, that's Tom's Open Micro USB device, um, was developed by members of our own LCA community, and its HAL crate, linked right there, includes some wonderful examples of how to blink the LED and um, how to boot it up just to get the user started with doing anything with that crate. So while an embedded board is really good at interfacing with the inputs and outputs in the environment, the sensors, the lights, the motors, whatever that might be, they're generally really lacking in the human readable output department. If your program fails in some way while it's running on the board, maybe it can blink an LED at you, and that's generally about it. So in order to get actual useful debug information off of a program while it's running on an embedded system, you're going to probably want a technique known as semi-hosting. So this is where the code um, is connected to the host machine, probably your development environment, and it can put its errors and panics back to your console and um, log them out for you to analyze later on. So just basically look for a semi-hosting crate for your platform or family of platforms, and then you can log messages from your chip as it has them um, back to your host machine. There's a fantastic example of semi-hosting in the embedded Rust book for the Cortex-M that they're using in uh, their examples. So. Definitely look for that if you want um, I.O. in a useful feedback kind of sense. Another challenge of, of designing embedded REST programs is another side effect of the I.O. heavy nature of all of the IoT stuff. Although the compiler can check the logic in your program, it doesn't know enough about what the peripheral devices attached to your board might do to make any guarantees about them. But the principles behind writing memory safe code still apply to writing safe interfaces to your peripherals. For anything that we can read or write, even if it's a peripheral device, we want either one mutable, that is, writable reference to it at any, give, at any time, or we can have as many readable ones as we want. The way that you enforce this when it comes to an external device is using the singleton design pattern, because when you use singletons, that helps the compiler verify that there's only one instance of this peripheral in the code. And once you know there's only one place in the code that's going to be pointing at, let's say, their networking chip, the little cell phone that the cartoon chips have, then the borrow checker can help you reason about whether it's possible for the code to ever try to read and write it simultaneously, which is the huge no-no. Um, the alternative to using the singleton pattern would be to use mutable global state to store that code that represents the peripheral, but that's guaranteed to be unsafe because you can't make any promises about whether the other parts of your program may try to write it while you're trying to read it or vice versa at any point in time. So another way to improve the compiler's ability to reason about your peripherals is to model them as state machines. A state machine is just a representation of which of several valid conditions the peripheral can transition between from which other ones. Like if I was in the state of waiting to give my talk, then I had to get on stage, give the intro, give the talk, and then take questions, it would be illegal to go directly from waiting to speak to taking questions. It just wouldn't make sense. So by quantifying that common sense um, in your code, it helps the compiler check whether any of your assumptions uh, have been or could be violated. So abstractions like, oh yes, express your peripheral as a state machine um, are written with a lot of lines of code. And this probably makes you worried that they'll produce larger or slower programs after compilation. But they use a bunch of structs that don't actually hold any data to represent the states, which 
might seem kind of unnecessary until you realize that as it compiles down, as long as they're empty, they'll just get compiled away because it's smart enough to realize it's got nothing in it, can have nothing in it, it'll never be needed um, at runtime. So you can get the benefit of having the logic expressed by these empty abstractions without the cost of having them alter the code that's produced at the end. That's the zero cost abstraction that Rustations go on about. And it's when you get basically the best of both worlds. Another challenge in writing embedded software is concurrency. If you take no special precautions around concurrency, it's possible that you might be halfway through doing something that you really don't want to get interrupted with, like reading or writing something, and then an interrupt fires and changes the state of that thing you were working with, and then who knows what's going to happen afterwards. You get undefined behavior, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So instead, there's three ways that you can tackle concurrency in your code. The first way to handle concurrency is to avoid it. Don't handle interrupts. And if you need to get the state of something around you, just pull it when you have time to. For some devices, especially those that upload data every so often or toggle their output upon detecting some condition that persists over time, this can actually be a perfectly viable solution. And avoiding concurrency altogether makes programs easier to write and easier to reason about and debug, but it's often not possible. So, Instead, when you need to handle concurrency on a board that supports it, you can use atomic operations that are provided by the instruction set of the device that you're targeting. For instance, if you're using a Cortex-M3, you'll have atomic operations um, for reads and writes that will just retry until they're successful if something that can't be interrupted was going on when they first tried to happen. For earlier cortexes, though, you won't have those. So if your board and your HAL crate support atomics, they can let you do um, important operations without the risk of them getting interrupted or ever getting forgotten to get done. But what if you don't have them? The final approach, if you've got to have concurrency, and you can't do atomics, is you can just temporarily disable interrupts while the important pieces of code are executed, but leave them on the rest of the time when the less critical code is going on. So those areas where there's no interrupts allowed are called critical sections, and the syntax for them will vary based on the crates that you're using to target your particular architecture. So they do have the drawback that if an interrupt just gets ignored, then you have to figure out what's going to happen, but that's less problematic than getting the undefined behavior of interrupting at the wrong time. So finally, one of the parts of CPU uh, behavior that you're going to have to micromanage when you don't have an OS helping you is telling it what all the registers do. The registers are just little spaces in memory where the processor stores little specific pieces of information. Each one has an address, and some of them store special information where the CPU will always look to that place for that fact, and others can hold whatever you want them to. So using the right specialized registers matters a lot because an instruction might read from a particular register, and if you have the wrong thing there, nothing is going to work as expected. So one of your jobs as an embedded programmer is to tell Rust about what registers that target platform has available and what they do. Rather than writing everything out by hand, you can define your registers using a tool called SVD to Rust that's based on the system view description format files that are often provided by chip manufacturers that are a standard way of telling you what all the registers are, and it can convert these into support crates. Um, if you search crates.io for SVD to Rust plus the name of the chip or chip family that you're targeting, somebody might have already made this support crate for you and provided it. So otherwise, you can use the SVD to Rust tool itself to turn an SVD file into um, a Rust-compatible expression of what those registers are. So if you're interested in learning more about embedded or low-level Rust by reading it, the many operating systems that are written in Rust can be a great place to see it really pushing the boundaries. So a few of those, um, the Redox OS is probably the most famous of those, and it runs on the nightly Rust that has all of the cool new features. There are others, though. Um, Robogalia is trying to improve the Rust ecosystem around the SEL4 microkernel, so if that's something that interests you, check out their site. And 
if you'd really just like to be walked through a teaching operating system that comes with a book explaining systems concepts as they apply to it, check out Intermezzos, which is exactly that teaching OS to help programmers transition into systems programming. So another thing to call out, especially since we're talking about IoT today, is that there's the Talk operating system and project there at talkos.org that offers a couple of open hardware boards and is customized for them that's focused on improving the IoT ecosystem. So if open hardware is a big deal to you and you want to go buy a board or produce a board that has a huge amount of Rust support, seriously consider their Hale and iMix products. So, as I mentioned at the start of this talk, Rust's embedded resources have expanded so much, even just in the 10 months since I proposed this talk, to fill what felt at the time like a gap in their documentation. So, there's now an embedded working group with an IRC channel and the handle Rust Embedded on Twitter. So, you can Absolutely join them, ask them questions, they are the experts. There's a couple of books out, the Embedded Nomicon and the Debugger Nomicon. Um, this is a common naming convention for how to write unsafe Rust is just always the Nomicons. Um, if you would like to go into more detail. And the Working Group's repository has a bunch of things, including um, they're working at the moment on a repository and a website of showcasing a bunch of cool um, embedded projects that's not ready yet, but pretty soon they'll be ready for polls proposing your own REST embedded projects to be showcased there. And if you're just getting started in embedded development, I'd strongly recommend the REST embedded discovery book, which is focused on teaching people about how to use microcontrollers who haven't used microcontrollers before and just happening to use REST as the language they do it in. So with that, I've basically surveyed the core concepts of embedded Rust to hopefully launch you out into doing or continuing your own Rust projects. And I would like to use the rest of the time that's available to me, these last 15 minutes, to have more or less a mini boff. The way that I would like this to work is I'd like to hear from those of you who have Rust IoT projects or just Rust projects or want to start one. So put up your hand, we'll come around with a mic and tell us basically these questions. Um, what's your favorite Rust IoT project or the project you contribute to or that you're looking for? Um, what kind of help and feedback does it need? Um, what should people search to find it online? And for everybody that shares a project up until I run out, I have a little Rust mascot for you. And if we give you one of these, please display it through the conference. And if you want to talk about Rust to, to someone, find someone with the mascot on them and you will know that they are a friendly Rust nerd. So if you have questions, we can take questions in the end, at the end outside, but I would recommend talking to the experts who are using and doing these projects because so many questions are value judgments and matters of experience and opinion that you will get a better answer from polling several people who've tried it at different times than from asking any one speaker. So with that, um, let's start going around to, for people to share their IoT Rust stuff. <laughs> Hi, thanks Emily. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I'm William Brown, uh, or First Year Online. Uh, my, I have a number of projects. One of them is a LifeX-based light bulb controller, which is for my home network. It also does party hard mode, so you can turn your house into the rave that you've always wanted. Um, Generally what I do is I actually specialize in concurrency, parallel algorithms, and unsafe code. I think the LifeX controller is the only thing where I don't have unsafe. So I'm, I'd love to help you with your project. So if you want some mentoring, please come and talk to me about this stuff. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate Stewart, and I'm with the Zephyr Project. And so one of the things uh, we're interested in, obviously, is running um, an OS, very lightweight OS. And so I'm sort of curious, is there any work being done on having a Rust port, Rust standard library port into Zephyr to be running with it Do you, that you know of? I'm not, I'm not personally aware of a Zephyr port off the top of my head, but there could very well be one quietly 
being discussed or worked on online that I just don't happen to have seen yet because I haven't looked for it. So okay. I would strongly recommend both searching it and asking the embedded working group in their channel and asking around the Zephyr community because things are often just quietly not quite open yet because people aren't quite happy with them yet for quite some time before they become really public and easy to find. Cool, thanks. Hi, it's, it's more of a generic Rust uh, related question rather than an IT project, I'm afraid. Um, so I work for ARM, um, who create a load of CPU IP. Um, one of the issues that we have is engaging with the Rust community to ensure that Rust is properly ported, supported, um, ensuring that Rust has support for all the latest features and whiz bang blinky things that we decide to throw in uh, that our partners want to create or whatever else. Do you have any recommendations, suggestions, pointers as to how we can facilitate the wider Rust community much better? Absolutely. So I would say that the core team is your best point of contact there. And if you go to the core team and ask for their feedback on your current engagement with the community, then they can probably point you exactly where you can help best. There's a bit of a concern in that Rust is a fully volunteer project. Some people are paid to work on Rust, but that's generally Rust for their particular company's needs. And so there's, um, there's some ambiguity in your comment about whether or not you're expecting, here's some hardware, please implement all of the things for us. If that's the case, then um, making sure that there's something in it for the people doing the implementation um, can help a lot. If that's, um, if that's not the case, just I think working, working directly with the core team, working with the infrastructure team, if you're concerned about the test story, for instance, if you're like, why, aren't you, why isn't this tier one? Why aren't you testing, building and testing everything on it? Maybe it's we don't have the hardware because no one has um, provided us with hardware and, or no one's running the hardware or whatever that might be. And whatever that answer is to the question, what can we do to get this to a higher support tier and to contribute better, um, they will be able to point you in the best direction for that um, engagement. And we could brainstorm later on about community involvement strategies, about basically marketing your project, maybe um, have a bit about better publicizing um, what can be done with it, but let's continue for now. I would be delighted to talk to you after about just um, ideas for how to make it um, better known. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I just wanted to mention a big part of IoT is obviously mobile applications to interact with those. Um, we've recently started using Rust for iOS and Android in production, and we've found it to be brilliant. Like the um, Android bindings and the, uh, the iOS bindings are just excellent. So if you are making an IIT device, consider using Rust because then you can use Rust for your device itself and also for the core parts of iOS and Android. Might save you some time. <laughs> Fantastic, absolutely. Thank you for that feedback. We've got one right, uh, right there too. Yeah, we've got lots of people. Go for it. Hi. Um, I actually come from the other way. I'm an embedded developer on microcontrollers using C. And I'm wondering, so there's obviously a way to for C and Rust to talk to each other, mm -hmm. but whether there's any plans or hopefully implementation to be also able to reuse all the tooling that's available for C, because there's some really, really nice things such as st streaming trace to actually see all of your executions in one place. And things like, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, existing RTOS integration where you can see several threads and what are their call stacks are. And also things like having a microcontroller that can support external memory interface. So you have an internal SRAM and external DRAM, which is slower and bigger and have being able to access those. So yeah. So I'm not personally familiar with what the state of the art in that is. However, I would strongly recommend stopping by the Rust Embedded Working Group's channel and asking them 
what they're doing and what they want to do with that, and they'll likely point you towards some people who are quietly working on it or quietly thinking about it. Mm. Thank you. Got so maybe it's partially overlapping with his question, but what's the debug story right now? Because I used Rust uh, about one year ago for ASM.js stuff, and mm -hmm. I got stuck into debugging is really, really hard. ASM.js ASM is also a kind of new platform, so it's not just Rust being immature, but what about uh, you know, embedded programming? So yeah, debugging is absolutely hard. Um, I don't know of a language in which embed embedded debugging is necessarily easy. Um, if there's a language in which it's radically easier and they have a tooling story that makes it radically easier, I'm pretty sure that the um, developers and myself would love to hear about how we could adopt that. Um, the, the debug story, I mean, you want, I, I, is that an answer up there? Ah, yes, what is your possible answer? <laughs> I will, sorry, I'm really giving my volunteers their exercise. <laughs> um, so on Embedded, I've used a product called Black Magic Pro before, which is basically, it gives you a serial port to a JTAG interface. And I've actually messed around a bit with using Rust on that, and you do get cool stacks, and you can put breakpoints and stuff like that on, and you don't have to worry too much about LLDB talking to your device and stuff. So I can recommend if you're using your Cortex-M0 or Cortex-M3, check out a Black Magic Probe. It's not amazing debugging, but it will give you kind of the very basics of, you know, core stacks and stuff cool. like that. Thank you for the suggestion. And yeah, the best tool is very likely to vary per platform. Mm -hmm. um, Black and Blackmagic is open source. Thank you for that add-on. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, uh, I'm Wes. Um, I run a little project called Read Rust, um, which collects blog posts uh, from the Rust community. And this is a bit of a future call for participa participation, but I'm currently working on um, a version two that would let me recruit other people to help um, post the, the articles and, and approve them. So if anyone's keen to get involved, um, I'm also working on this new version being based on, uh, it already uses a bunch of Rust tools, but the new version is gonna be built as a Rust web server as well. So there'll be some coding involved as well. Um, it's still early days, so it's probably still a couple of months off before I'd need extra people, but yeah, if anyone's interested, come see me. Fantastic. Uh, I guess just as some inspiration to people, so I've been using these Nordic-based uh, uh, embedded chips, which is a Bluetooth low energy chipset with an ARM M4 embedded. Uh, and I was interested to look at the Rust IoT, so I thought, well, maybe I could help implement it. But I looked, and there's actually a seemingly relatively mature project for it already. So I guess what I'm excited to see is there's actually quite some mature ecosystem around Rust Embedded. So, yeah, I'm going to try it out. And I guess the inspiration to others is, even if you think it's more obscure, maybe there's already stuff going on in the Rust space for it, and you may not have to start from scratch. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that feedback, because I've been surprised as well. I'm like, I've never even heard of this architecture, and yet it's got robust Rust things happening. <laughs> Uh, not particularly IoT related, but I'm in the middle of writing uh, some Rust code for graph algorithms, a port of an earlier C module, uh, with a particular emphasis on the fact that lots of problems involve standard graph algorithms, but you don't usually want to change all your data structures into the form that most graph libraries want them um, in order to do that. Uh, so if anyone wants to assist with that, particularly if they know the sort of rustish idiom ways of doing things, then that would be most appreciated. Fantastic. It looks like we have time for one or two more. Anyone else up there? Hi, uh, not quite an IoT project, but it is embedded. Um, if anyone doesn't know, these Sony cameras actually can run Android. Uh, so what started out as an attempt at um, porting over the Google HDR app to try and get amazing photos out of it, and then installing Instagram on that, <laughs> um, which I can post directly to Instagram. As one does. Um, I, I've been looking at uh, playing around with computer vision with one of these, and yeah, have a talk to me later if you want to see where I'm at. Fantastic. Um, one down here as well. No, an IT project, but 
and something I haven't really worked on that much in a while is stuff to work, try and make sort of a screenshotting slash video recording thing in Rust that will be able to catch uh, frames to turn a presentation into a bunch of slides because you have transitions and multiple things having the points come up, which is hard to capture apart from screenshotting. But I wanted to capture basically everything in the state to turn it into a bunch of images with timestamps and then optimize it down. And so it's in the state of it was working on Windows and then I realized that I'm actually not doing it well and it didn't work where I was actually wanting it to work. <laughs> and so, yeah. All right. Well, it looks like we're just about at time. Thank you, everybody, for your feedback and your publication of your various REST um, and REST IoT projects. So. You can get these slides and notes at that link. You can find me on Twitter or on IRC. And I will be around. We can do a rest buff later. If anyone wants a rest buff, just post to the chat list. Um, and thank